On July 18, 2014, Toronto-born Florida State University professor Dan Markell, father of two young boys, Benjamin and Lincoln, was gunned down in his home in Tallahassee, Florida. For nearly a decade, the Markell family has waited for justice. While other dominoes in the case have fallen leading up to now, it was the conviction of Markell's brother-in-law, Charlie Adelson, who managed to elude justice for years in the killing, was convicted Monday on all counts. The 12-person jury deliberated only about three hours before announcing it had reached unanimous decision. We, the jury, find as follows as the defendant is guilty of first-degree murder. Today, we take a look at the case the aftermath, and I share an interview segment that I did with Dan's mother, Ruth Markell, earlier this year. As a survivor myself, I am here to offer you my perspective on what comes next and what healing will look like. I'm Collier Landry. Let's get into it. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial. When I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. I decided at an early age that our trauma should not be what defines us. It's what we choose to do with it that does. I'm here to share my unique perspective on true crime, mental health, society, and popular culture, albeit with a slight sense of humor. I'm Collier Landry, and welcome to my show. Live on a Wednesday from a blustery Los Angeles, California, it's the Call Your Landry Show. Wherever you may be and however you may be listening, thanks for making me a part of your day. This is the show where we move beyond the headlines to offer you my unique perspective on true crime, mental health, society, and popular culture, albeit with a slight sense of humor. Mover Nation, here we are. It has been a week in the true crime world, um, and a lot of you uh, who have come to this show are familiar with the Dan Markell case, are familiar with Charlie Adelson and what has been happening, and good friends of the channel, Joel and Carm over at Surviving the Survivor have been doing wonderful work on this, but I will bring a lot of you up to speed who are not familiar with this case because, man, this is a... um, this one is a doozy. Myself being, as the intro shows, a homicide survivor, I have a really unique perspective on this. And later on in the show, I'm going to bring you guys an exclusive interview that I did with with Ruth Markell, who is Dan Markell's mother. And she's going to share her story of fighting to get to be able to see her grandchildren, who are unfortunately, as I know all too well, are the real casualties in all of this, having lost a father, a family, and now as the truth starts to slowly trickle out maybe even more members of their family now they've lost an uncle so this story as i said at the top of the at the top of the show uh goes back to july 18th 2014 and that is when florida state university law professor dan markell was shot to death in the garage of his tallahassee home now, this was a major case that made major headlines. I was not familiar with this case, um, full disclosure, until uh, a good friend of my show and obviously of Joel and Carm's, uh, Stephen Cohen, shout out to him, brought this to my attention last year and said, have you, have you looked into this? And, um, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty floored um, because, you know, this is now going on 10 years since this murder happened. Uh surely over nine years and um so but it did catch a lot of media attention but i unfortunately don't remember it at the time i don't even remember what i was doing back in 2014 oh i was working as a cinematographer but um so you know obviously there's been a lot of reporting on this over the years and uh the the reason is is because this this case is very intertwined with you have Hitmen involved, you have gang members from the Latin Kings gang based out of Miami involved, and you have this very sort of triangulated relationship between hiring hitmen and a strange girlfriend who worked for the family's dental practice and Charlie Adelson himself and with other potential members of the Adelson family, but we will get into that. That might have to, might end up being a part of all of this. Um, Again, with my with my experience in these things, I I am someone who is always shocked. I think as most of you are, but and as someone who has been affected directly by violent crime, uh, at how people think that they can get away with this type of stuff. And 
you know, we, I've covered other cases on this channel, uh, the Murdoch case, for example, which was referred to as the iPhone trial, and there was all this evidence, and, and obviously we have the Delphi case, which is still going on, which now involves Snapchat and videos that have been recorded, as I actually did the Murdoch case as well. But the trails that these perpetrators leave, and specifically uh, in this case, it starts off with these two hitmen that were hired. So uh, this is Luis Rivera and Fredo Garcia, who had driven from Miami to Tallahassee with the intent of taking the life of Mr. Markel. And along the way, <laughs> they had rented a Prius uh, uh, to drive because, of course, they're, they're, they're eco-conscious, uh, eco-conscientious. But um, they, uh, there is surveillance footage all along the way from toll stops to gasoline <laughs> to gas stations to, to Markel's own neighborhood of them trailing him. And um, uh, it was a pretty cut and dry case. But again, it, you know, I believe their first conviction... And confession had had, um, I believe, occurred back in 2016. If I'm not mistaken, it may be, I may be mis, I may be mistaken on that. I'm going to show you guys a couple of uh, photographs as well. Here, we're going to go to this uh, this article online, which is uh, which shows a little bit about uh, what I'm discussing. So this is obviously Dan Markell. Handsome fellow, also a, a, a staunch um, practicing uh, man of Jewish faith. We'll get into that a little bit later because that has something to do with it. This is Ruth, his wonderful mother, who I was able to interview, who we will hear from a little bit later in the segment. And then uh, this is Charlie Adelson, who is the man who was just convicted for being the mastermind of this uh, murder for hire plot. This is the rest of his family. This is his mother, Donna, uh, his sister, Wendy Adelson, who was married to Dan Markell, and obviously Charlie herself, and then the father, who, whose name escapes me. They have a very successful uh, dental practice in the Miami and South Florida area, and um, uh, I believe he is a periodontist, for those of you that, that don't know what a periodontist is. They make a lot of money, and they do a lot of dental work, <laughs> high-end dental work, like making your teeth look beautiful. I have not used the services of a periodontist, but I have done videos for a periodontist, which I am doing this Saturday. <laughs> um, and a very nice periodontist. Nobody would ever do anything like this. But um, these are the the conspirators. So this is uh, Louis, Louis Rivera, Catherine uh, Mac, Macbanua, Macbanua. I believe she must be Filipino with that last name. Macbanua. And Sigfredo Garcia. Now, Mac Catherine McBanawa was dating at one time Charlie Adelson, and she worked for the family's dental practice. And one of the the things that was discussed is the Markels on, and Wendy Adelson, who was married to Dan Markel, they were going through a divorce. They were about a year out of their divorce when his life was taken. He uh, and, and a bitter custody battle had been ensuing. But of course, like every uh, every brother in law, you know, you might not like your you might not like your brother in law. And he was heard making comments such as, well, I bought my sister a television instead of hiring a hitman. And he even joked about that with a few people. But as the court documents show and as his conviction shows, which, again, the verdict was returned in less than four hours. Um, he did, in fact, hire these people. So in October, I believe, of 2013, because this occurred in July, uh, in July of 2014, in October of 2013, he was having a conversation with his then girlfriend, this Catherine McBanawa, and asked her if he knew people that could, quote, get things done or harm people. And she said she would. Now, she shares a child with one of these gentlemen. I don't know which one it is. If it's Louis, I believe it's Louis Rivera. And they, uh, they had shared a child and he, they were connected to the Latin Kings gang, which is out of Miami. Now, I don't think I have to be, I have to say that, um, you know, um, upstanding individuals in the community and gang members don't mix. But unfortunately, Charlie Adelson decided to conflate the two. Uh, much to his much to his demise 
Um, but he he got involved and had her get involved as a conduit to arrange for the killing of Dan Markell. Now, a lot of people speculate, and again, uh, Wendy Adelson, his sister, is, I believe, an unindicted co-conspirator at this point. She has not been indicted, and this is, again, the, the mother of Dan Markell's two children. Uh, she has not been indicted as a co-conspirator uh, yet, <laughs> but she is um, definitely... A person of interest and has been for a long time and there's been a lot of conjecture that has surrounded this trial where people have been speculating what her involvement is has been in but a lot of this seems to stem from uh the ire that the family's matriarch donna adelston had regarding dan markell and his relationship with his boys and his relationship with his soon-to-be or then ex-wife wendy Adel Wendy Markell Adelson or Adelson Markell, however you however you say it. Um, so uh, this was a an ongoing uh, feud, if you will, between the two families. Uh, so much so that Dan Markell had, before his untimely death, he had. Um, requested that the court during supervised uh the court maintain supervised visits with his ex-mother-in-law because she was quote filling the boys heads with rubbish of course obviously when divorces get very nasty and and as a child whose parents were getting divorced before my mother's murder parents say a lot of things and there's a lot of conjecture that flies around and a lot of you know a lot of anger between people who are getting a divorce, right? It's just human nature. So obviously inflammatory and incendiary comments were probably leveled around the children about their father, about the situation with their mother. And of course, it's not cool to involve the kids in any of this. Uh, they already have enough damage and pieces to pick up. But nonetheless, uh, Dan Markell rightfully had asked for, had asked for supervised visits to sort of tone down the rhetoric coming from his, his ex-mother-in-law. So uh, a lot of people feel that it was at the direction of her, and this, of course, is conjecture, because as of right now, there have no, been no indictments handed down. The only person that has been convicted outside of Rivera McManaba, or <laughs> Magbanua <laughs> and Sigfredo Garcia is that um is that charlie adelson was convicted as well so as i said at the top of the hour all the dominoes continue to fall and we will see where all of this lies and where all of this ends up but the speculation is that the ire that was coming from donna was directed upon charlie adelson who then took it upon himself to rectify the situation on his sister's behalf again um this is someone, and, and this is often what I struggle with in these types of cases. This is a person who had absolutely nothing to gain from taking the life of someone else. First of all, you don't really have, you don't have, a, uh, you don't have anything to gain, gain anyways. And by the way, thank you so much, Cat Loves Cat Skills, for being a channel member for seven months. Your support is greatly appreciated. Uh, there is nothing to really gain from, from this other than... <laughs> Other than pure ego and and piss and vinegar, if you will, it's um, it's really unfortunate. And of course, Charlie, as a periodontist, was making it, you know in Miami, constructive plastic surgery, uh, um, um, cosmetic procedures uh, bring in a hefty price tag, and you make a lot of money. There was talk that he was making upwards of three and a half million dollars a year, driving Lamborghinis, fancy cars, living, tripping the life fantastic from about 2014 to 2018. Why he wanted to get involved in such, to use the Yiddish word, Michigas, I have absolutely no idea. But he did, and he's going to suffer the consequences. So um, it was... It was Rivera and and Sigfredo Garcia, and then obviously Catherine. McManawa, who um, they all ended up obviously folding in on each other because what had happened is during this time, and this is a lot of, uh, this is a, there's a lot of, um, there was a lot of evidence. <laughs> 
against Charlie Adelson because his defense was alleging that he was a victim, an extortion victim, that these individuals, these Latin King gang members that have absolutely no idea who Charlie Adelson is or who, or what he does or wanting to be involved with him, uh, had decided to take it upon themselves to rent said Prius and drive up to Tallahassee and take the life of Dan Markell in order to extort money for him, from him. Apparently, because he was carrying on this relationship with Catherine McBanawa, he would brag about things like keeping the money in the safe, uh, keeping you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash in the safe at his home, at his work. Uh, she was privy to the fact that he was moving and making lots of money and therefore decided to set him up. This is very vaguely familiar with a lot of things that had happened in my father's case where the people allege that my father's girlfriend uh, or mistress, really, because he was married to my mother, um, was trying to set my set my father up. And I'm actually very surprised that that never even came out in the trial or my father tried to make a defense out of that. He later, of course, alleged all of this, that there was a conspiracy involved, much like there was lots of conspiracies involved. But um, the notion that gang members would somehow do a very um, middleman sort of extortion plot and go out of their way to commit a homicide without the promise of money, go to a, an affluent neighborhood. And, and, you know, I used to live in Orlando, Florida. I don't really know how far Fort Lauderdale, Miami area is from Tallahassee, but I know it's not around the corner. And getting anyone to drive a rental car to go and implement and implicate themselves in a crime of this nature, no matter what their chosen profession is, whether it be illegal or not, is utterly fanciful. But this was always Adelson's defense that he was set up. It was an extortion tactic that they took Markel's life in order to extort money out of Adelson. Now, this was all sort of sort of debunked by the prosecution. Uh, in several different methods, one of which was apparently back in, I believe, 20 and, and correct me if I'm wrong on my dates, but it, it, in either 2018 or maybe it was 2020, 21 in the last five years before Charlie Adelson's arrest in 2020, which was in April of 2020 or sorry, tw uh, 2022, April of 2022. There was a, an, a, a government agent that had become an informant and working with the Latin Kings and had actually approached Adelson's mother, Donna, with a newspaper clipping headline about Markel's murder and had written on it $5,000 and gave it to her in an attempt to get $5,000 from her. This led to a series of wiretaps that had already been initiated by investigators of Markel's phone, or I'm sorry, not of Markel's phone, of Adelson's phone, of McBanawa's phone, I believe, and, uh, and the Adelson family's uh, phone and personal communication devices, where, um, uh, because they believed that they were, they were involved in, in hiring these killers. Also because the killers themselves said that they were hired. <laughs> um, but what had happened is uh, this this FBI agent uh, or this, this this federal agent or state agent acting um, as a, as a, a a member of the Latin Kings gang um, undercover uh, was able to they were able to wiretap this conversation that Donna Adelson had had with Charlie, where they were speaking in very odd, very bizarre code um, that in, in a way that normal people don't speak, and this was. This was used in the trial against Charlie Adelson saying, well, why were you speaking to your mother in code if you weren't doing anything wrong? Now, look, um, I speak to my parents on, an, uh, you know, at least several times a week. I don't think we ever speak in code unless I'm trying to not give up the answer to today's Wordle puzzle. Then, of course, I do speak in code. Ha ha ha. Like I said, albeit with a slight sense of humor, guys. <laughs> um but they were speaking in code. There was a lot of the, this exchanges. It also went around with McBanawa. Um, McBanawa as well. Uh, there was a lot of code and, and, and speaking. And, and there's a, uh, there is a trial that's going on right now, or maybe it's perhaps ended or it's in the, uh, um, this, this case of this woman, um, uh, Corey, um, 
uh, why is her name escaping me? Uh, she was the mother who had poisoned her husband with fentanyl, and she was also writing things in code. People don't speak in code unless they have something to hide. <laughs> it just really is the truth. So the, the, the notion that the defense came up with that this was somehow normal way that they speak is just completely, it's just utterly fanciful, as I said. But again, this, you know, set them off on a, on a, you know, sort of whole uh, parade of, or, or just, you know, just, just badness, just, just a trail of evidence that obviously led to Adelson's conviction. Um, and these, ex this extortion theory that his defense was trying to prove is, was again, pure rubbish. Also, uh, McManawa, who apparently had been offered a plea deal uh, before she was convicted for her role in this homicide and in this premeditated murder, um, she did not take a plea deal, which to me, um, I, I don't know a lot about her, her defense attorneys or what they advised her, um, but apparently maybe she felt a loyalty to Charlie Adelson, which she talks about in court. Um, maybe she didn't want to give up uh, her Latin King friends. Maybe she didn't want to get involved further. Maybe she was worried about the safety of her children. I don't know. But she did not turn state's evidence and take a plea, be plea deal that would have given her immunity and she would have walked away from all this. And in court, she basically came clean and said that she was lying about this extortion plot that she maintained in her own defense. Now, she originally had a mistrial and then she was retried and convicted last year, 2022. So, um, it's interesting. And again, when you talk about the casualties of these violent crimes, and, and for those of you that follow my story for a while, you know, I made a film called The Murder of Mansfield, which was all directly um, based upon my personal um I don't know if you would call it crusade, but my personal belief that a lot of times in these cases, we do not do not look at the, the victims or the circumstances that surround people or the ancillary victims that, um, are, that become a part of the fallout of these, um, of these situations where uh, the, these people are dragged in to this, to this nonsense and and make themselves a part of it and and they are they themselves become casualties and not only is it is it casualties because they've been manipulated or involved in the process somehow or motivated by greed but also there's uh, you know there are the ancillary victims of the community of the children of the grandparents of of now the family members of the bad actors in their family that are all now have this have this stain on their family name they have this stain on on what they have um, on 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 what is you know what they have been involved in, which will follow them for the rest of their lives, and it's um, people often don't think about the consequences of their actions. But, anyways, back to McManawa, she is now incarcerated for her involvement of this, but decides during the trial, of course, to to say that Adelson put her up to this and that she was lying to protect him and that there was indeed a payoff scheme that was going on, that he was making monthly payments of $3,000 a month or something to that extent, and also made a lump sum payment to these guys of $100,000 to take the life of, of Dan Markell. Not worth it, guys, not worth it. But, you know, that's not my profession. That's their profession. And hey, you know, um, it obviously didn't end well for them. Uh, Charlie Adelson also during this trial, apparently threw members of the Latin Kings, uh, gang organization under the bus as well, as would be, as would to be expected, if you will, because, um, yeah, not a smart guy, not a smart guy thinking it, it's, it's, it never, I, I really firmly believe in looking at them and you, and you see when he takes the, when he took the witness stand, uh, you know, they firmly believe and my father also took the witness in his defense. And one of the things that my father often to, uh, has told me many times since being convicted is that everyone told him when you get to prison, never take the witness stand in your own defense. It never works out in your favor. Of course, my father was uttering, uh, you know, complete rubbish and lies and probably Charlie Adelson was too. Uh, but 
if you saw on Monday his face when he was convicted, he was pretty shocked. He was wholeheartedly convinced that everyone had bought his story, and clearly no one was buying his story, much less a jury of his peers. Um, again, it uh, it is a situation that is really sad. A man has lost his life. Now two young boys have been growing up without, without their father, and now they're facing the possibility that their family, their mother's side of the family has been responsible. Well, ha clearly has their uncle was responsible, but maybe even potentially their grandmother and even their own mother could have been responsible for this crime. Now, Wendy Angelson was called to the witness stand in her brother's trial and had said that she was not aware of any of this. Of course, she was used the uh, the age old babe in the woods routine. I didn't know any of this even until this morning that my brother had talked to members of a gang member, et cetera, et cetera. Um, hubris is always one of those words that comes to mind. But again, uh, I was as someone who has sort of been following this case from the outside, I haven't really talked about it on my show. Uh, someone who's been following it from the outside and speaking to different people involved with different aspects of it. Um, uh, I was, I was relieved for the Markell family that there's more that the, that the wheels of justice are spinning in their favor because again, this is this is this murder occurred in July of 2014. It is now November 8th of 2023. He was convicted on November 6th, 2023. That's a long time to wait for justice. And um, although I might die out the majority of my gray hair, I would probably be even grayer than I am now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a lot of people are looking at this case and are getting a sense that justice and the wheels of justice will continue to spin as we get into this. Um, yeah, and it causes it's caused a lot of people stress. Now, speaking of stress, the holidays are upon us. And Mover Nation, you guys know how I love my premium CBD from Next Evo Naturals Premium CBD. Uh, whenever I'm feeling a little bit anxious or uh, or even having trouble sleep during the holidays, I turn to Triple Action Premium CBD from Next Evo Naturals. Now you guys can too, and you can get 25% off by using my code MPT at nextevo.com forward slash MPT. That is N-E-X-T-E-V-O.com forward slash MPT to get 25% off your purchase of Next Evo Naturals Premium CBD Supplements. I'm telling you, they are a lifesaver. I use them when I travel. I use them when I'm feeling anxious or when I'm just trying to get a great night's sleep. I know many of you, Mover Nation, have used them and you are loving them. And I thank you for your support. Again, that's nextevo.com forward slash MPT, N-E-X-T-E-V-O.com forward slash MPT to get 25% off your purchase today. I want to move into a pre-recorded interview that I did with uh, with Ruth Markell, who talks a little bit about her book. She talks about her, her fight as not only a mother of a, a grieving mother of a son whose life was taken for literally, I can see no reason, but also, um, you know, the, the struggle that she had to fight to see her grandchildren. Now, one of the things that I had mentioned at the top of the hour that Dan Markell was a devout, uh, practitioner of the Jewish faith. One of the things that, uh, and, and the Adelsons are also of the Jewish faith as well. One of the things that, uh, that Dan Markell had had a problem with his mother-in-law, uh, Donald Adel Donna Adelson, uh, is that she was threatening to convert his two children, his two sons, to the Christian faith in order to defy their devout Jewish father. Um, to fly in the face of him. So again, when, we, when I was speaking of the divorce and when you hear uh, Ruth Markell talk a little bit about this and her fight to see her grandchildren and how that ultimately turned into a law, uh, which was signed last year by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, um, you know, her fight to see her grandchildren and maintain her family's presence in those boys' lives, Benjamin and Lincoln. So I'm going to play that interview 
for you guys. Now, um, this is part of a segment. We are having uh, Ruth on as our guest on next week's episode of the Survivor Squad podcast that I co-host with Tara Newell. Uh, tomorrow's episode will be Survivor of the Milwaukee Strangler. Uh, Denise Winters is our guest. And then next week will be Ruth Markell sharing her story in a much longer form interview. But this is a snippet. I had interviewed her for my show and I wanted to share this because I figured, hey, it's very apropos. And I want to shift the focus to where it really belongs, which is the aftermath of the family and the healing process that is going to go on for those boys moving forward. So, uh, you know, let, let's uh, let's get into it here. I, I look, I think 100 percent we are all here. In fact, uh, you know, homicide survivors, right? There's 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 a term here We're homicide survivors. And we're also it's important to recognize, too victims victims in the law pre in the law proceedings like in other words there's legal legal issues of uh, for crime around victims right I, yeah. victim impact statements yeah. there there's a lot of uh, of it. it has its own course of action sure. and and so forth but i i think we have to talk about uh you know the, the homicide survivors and what happens to them and i'm really one of the things about why i'm writing is all these school shootings now, like you have in the States, even yeah. you know, since we started talking about from the book and everything else. And, and we have in Canada, we don't have the same amount frequency, but we have some really big events that have happened here, sure. you know, 20 people, 25 people. But all these families are suffering. And, and, and that's what I think has to be talked about, because otherwise it just becomes glitz, you know. So the book is called The Unveiling. And it's a mother's reflection on murder, grief, and the trial life, okay? And there's two reasons that I wrote the book and two descriptions of the title. The first title is related, and I think we have to talk about grief too today because I think, you know, you've all suffered tremendously. And I really want to talk to the public about grief, you know, with all of the school shootings, going on with so much loss, it's time to really talk about that. So one of the purposes for me of calling it the unveiling, the first is there's a Jewish ritual, which comes about, ours was about six months after the funeral. And the ritual is to put the tombstone down and to put a curtain over the inscription, because we write a fair amount on the tombstone. And then there's an actual ceremony and service to lift this uh, curtain, so to speak, this piece of fabric, which covers the tombstone, and that's called the unveiling. For me, that was the beginning of the grief story, the deep, deep grief. Up until that time, I was in shock, and I think you all share this. I was in a daze. I had an out-of-body experience, and I had all those, you know, terrible feelings of initial blows and so forth. But when yeah, we yeah. did the service and coming up to the service, the fact that there was a tombstone, which was on top of the grave site, for me, that was the finality of the death, right? Like if you see visually, there's there's something that just, you know, the expression, and it's so true for us, for me personally, you know, the nail in the coffin. And that was really my beginning of the grief story. So that was one of the reasons I wrote the book to really talk about grief now i can say with absolute certainty that uh that the finality of the funeral is something that all people who have survived these types of situations um it, it is something that really allows for closure it was something that i did not have have the ability to have with my mother. I wasn't allowed to go to her funeral, but I'm, I'm, I was so glad when Ruth was telling me about this, that she had that moment to have that closure with her son, because it is really, really, really key to your, to your being able to move on and to being able to, to sort of process what has happened in this tragedy. So I'm really grateful for that. And I'm grateful that she talks about this the homicide survivors and what happens to them. And I'm really, one of the things about why I'm writing is 
all these school shootings now, like you have in the States, even yeah. you know, since we started talking about from the book and everything else, and, and we have in Canada, we don't have the same amount frequency, but we have some really big events that have happened here, sure. you know, 20 people, 25 people. But all these families are suffering, and, and, and that's what I think has to be talked about because otherwise it just becomes glitz, you know. So the book is called The Unveiling, and it's a mother's reflection on murder, grief, and the trial life, okay? And there's two reasons that I wrote the book and two descriptions of the title. The first title is related, and I think we have to talk about grief too today because I think, you know, you've all suffered tremendously, and I really want to talk to the public about grief you know, with all of the school shootings going on with so much loss, it's time to really talk about that. So one of the purposes for me of calling it the unveiling, the first is there's a Jewish ritual which comes about, ours was about six months after the funeral. And the ritual is to put the tombstone down and to put a curtain over the inscription because we write a fair amount on the tombstone. And then there's an actual ceremony and service to lift this uh, curtain, so to speak, this piece of fabric, which covers the tombstone, and that's called the unveiling. For me, that was the beginning of the grief story, the deep, deep grief. Up until that time, I was in shock, and I think you all share this. I was in a daze. I had an out-of-body experience, and I had all those, you know, terrible feelings of initial blows and so forth. But when yeah, we yeah. did the service and coming up to the service, the fact that there was a tombstone, which was on top of the grave site, for me, that was the finality of the death, right? Like if you see visually, there's, there's something that just, you know, the expression, and it's so true for us, for me personally, you know, the nail in the coffin. And that was really my beginning of the grief story. So that was one of the reasons I wrote the book to really talk about grief. The second and even more important, which is to lift the veil, picture a curtain, a veil to the public to see what trial life is about, to see what it feels like to go through the criminal system, you know, to go through investigations, to go through hearings. We had multiple, multiple, multiple hearings until we got the first uh, just just so everyone knows, yes, this is Ruth Markell. This is Dan Markell's mother, who I interviewed earlier in the year. This is an excerpt from my interview. The full interview will be available on uh, my Survivor Squad podcast that I co-host with Tara Newell next week uh, as, our, as our featured episode for Thursday and Friday release. This trial. Then we had the pandemic. So that was another postponement, you know, of Catherine's retrial. Then, then we, we had appeals, and even Garcia appealed. At the moment, uh, Catherine is appealing her, um, her sentence. And then we, you know, you have like uh, Charlie Adelson just had the Arthur hearing. So how this story goes is two parts. There's grief, the trial life, and then there's my role in advocacy. And I'll explain to you the, the question yeah. you just answered, asked me about April 20th. The first two years, we were able to see the children. We had visits with them and so forth. Now, in 2016, you talked about being abandoned. There was all this talk about arrests, and I got uh, concerned and anxious in plain English that the children, my grandchildren, Benjamin and Lincoln, could be in a situation where if there's arrest, they'll go to the Department of Family and Children's Services. That was what I did not want to do, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's just standard you know, for people that don't understand. Well, how does it happen? Like, it's just a procedure. Like, it just happens. It, it, it's, it, it, you have to sort of, as a family member, intervene with that <laughs> in a lot of ways. Exactly the point. So what I didn't want is at all any foster care, but I made an inquiry into uh, a, 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 an agency called JAFCO, Jewish Agency, which is also as licensed by the Department of Family and Children's Services, not to have foster care, but to have a two-night stay in case the children were without any 
family members and these, you know, South Florida members. Anyway, that that letter that I wrote to the prosecutor got out by mistake. And at that point, Wendy cut us all off from visiting the grandchildren. We didn't see the grandchildren for six years. So what happened in the period of time following that was we went on, we talked about the media. We were very privileged all along uh, to, there was a lot of media from day one on this case. And we went on Dateline, Phil, his dad's father, and we went on Dateline. We went on ABC 2020. We went on quite a few shows and so forth to try to talk about the grandparent issue. Our lawyers talked to Wendy's lawyers, but nothing happened. It was at the point after um, Garcia's trial. Now, people had told me, I live in Canada now, that I should write a bill in Florida for grandparents. So grandparent alienation is a huge social problem. We have several distinct stories here, right? One is crime, and one is grandparent alienation, and one is advocacy. Look, people, I do write about this because in this story has all the sensationalism all the glitz, and my life is far from glitzy, and all the media, which is great, it does support our story. We have social media support on Justice for Dan, uh, which is a you know a site on Facebook, and they do phenomenal work uh, and so forth. So, but the victims re really do get lost in in the story, and the children get lost altogether. So this is the thing that I you know as. <laughs> As heartbreaking as this is to hear Ruth's words on this, it also, as someone who's lived through this same type of scenario, it makes me feel good that there are other people that recognize this and that are speaking out again about this and speaking out as victims' advocates, being victims themselves and bringing up that, hey, we have rights too. Hey, these children have rights too. There is, you know, to see this kind of advocacy and to and to see this woman's strength, because I believe Ruth Markell is well into her 80s, to see her strength for her son as a son who is strong for his mother and to see a mother being strong for her son and her grandchildren is really, really heartwarming. It's something to me that when I was talking to her and I've cut myself for the sake of the audience, I've cut my talking out of this so you guys can just listen to her talk. But, um, you know, it was it was really a breath of fresh air to see someone who cared, who who just didn't let allow herself to be defeated. You know, again, this is she's speaking to me. This is either the end of 2022 or beginning of 2023 when I interviewed her. And she, um, you know, obviously just now getting another layer of justice, right? Because it's one thing to get the gang members convicted who were hired and, and whatnot. Like, even though that is a sense of justice, they took Dan's life. They, in a lot of ways, were 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 pawns in this being used by Charlie Adelson, you know, uh, and, and they were willing pawns. Don't get me wrong. They were willing people who participated and took the life of another human being. And that's just sort of their business. If you will, like they're in a gang, that's kind of what happens, right? There's, there's stuff that happens, you know, um, that's their business, but they would not have been involved with Dan Markell's murder if they had not been hired for this. So really for them to get the justice to see someone like Charlie Adelson who planned this get convicted and again, get convicted by a jury of his peers in under four hours had to be an overwhelming just sense of, and, and it's a, it's a bittersweet sense of justice or sense of, of fulfillment because again, no one wants this. Nobody wants to see this. Nobody wants to be involved in this. Nobody wants this kind of nonsense in their life. So it's like, yes, okay, we got a conviction, but you know, it sucks that there was even this, that we're even having to go down and deal with any of this heartache and that the family has to pick up the pieces from this. So to hear her talk about this, I think is a really enlightening and important thing because I talk about this, as you guys know, on the show all day long and to see one uh, to see someone and hear someone else who's been through similar circumstances talking about it. It's, it's, it's very, very, it's very, very cool. Uh, I'll let her continue. 
and 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 we don't know what they know and whatever and and it's a very difficult time so what happened was i was encouraged to write a bill for grandparents people said to me you're not going to see the children unless you get some kind of a bill. and this is something that is just really just really cool to me too is that she took her advocacy to the next level and she got a bill passed and that's really cool because not only did she say, okay, this is what I went through, but I don't want anyone else to go through these circumstances too. It's something that I, I definitely felt and, and wanted to share my story to be able to, to help others. And so to see her take action and say, I'm going to use this tragedy in the name of my son, in the name of my family to do something positive so other people don't have to experience this. Because as she explains, the grandparents' rights in Florida are a lot different than any other state, which is just crazy because isn't isn't where, where retirees go is to florida so why their why their laws would be so wacky in this is beyond me but i'll let her continue with the story bill in florida now florida has the most restrictive grandparents rights um legislation and but i was i was i was coached so to speak but not yet ready and uh and that's another message you know talking about serious messages there's many people who've lost a loved one and particularly a child. And you want to do something. You want to start a foundation. You want to do something to remember them. And you you kind of sit on it. And I and it took me three years till I really acted on the advice that I had, but I wasn't free yet from the criminal system. And then what happened? Garcia's, Garcia is convicted in 2019. I'm in Tallahassee. And I, and I actually go, it's a funny story. I went to the hairdresser and this young woman comes over to me and she says, can I give you a hug? And I said, sure. Mm -hmm. I knew she was Danny's age, lived in Tallahassee. I didn't, you know, mm -hmm. didn't really know her. And then she says, let's meet for a coffee afterwards. And I said, sure. So she says, what can I do for you? And I blurted out grandparent alienation. So here is what I'm showing you as the victim side of my feeling uh, was sort of getting resolved a little bit. You know, Garcia is convicted. Now I'm ready to take on the grandparent issue. Yeah, yeah. And she was amazing. And, and she said, done. She, I didn't know her at all. Her name is, you know, Karen, Karen Halpern Cypher. She has a big position in Tallahassee and the media company. She knew all yeah. kinds of people <laughs> and, you know, introduced and you need politics, right? It's all related. And, the, you know, we, in 2020, I met her in October they had a like a bill that was went through the senate it didn't have time to go through the whole legislature but the senate passed it but in 2022 is the big year 2022 we had major success governor DeSantis just signed a bill for grandparents in uh, june of 2022 it's called informally the markel act that's not the proper name no. it has a proper title but a, like a bill name and a bill number but what it allows is for families where there's a deceased parent and the other parent has either criminal or civil findings, okay? The grandparents can go to the court and ask for visitation. So okay. this is really a, a big breakthrough where there is something like, like a murder. We have not yet um, used it or not entitled to because there's not a criminal uh, you know, citing yet. On Keyword in this would be yet, um, because unfortunately, as a lot of people are talking about, uh, Wendy Adelson um, is an unindicted co-conspirator. A lot of people are talking about that. And I don't know if that's an official court <laughs> court designation or legal designation, but that is what has been being touted around the interwebs and uh, because of her involvement and um, or, or 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 lack thereof or whatever it is on the witness stand, as I said, uh, Wendy Adelson said she wasn't aware of any of this, <laughs> and she talks about her move from Tallahassee down to uh, I believe Fort Lauderdale or about to South Florida, even leaving a an ex boyfriend at the time and situations it's all very to use the parlance of our time sus sus for sure um but we'll see how all this unfolds but i'll let ruth continue to talk because um what she's saying is really powerful here and anybody like related but the point is after that bill was passed and catherine's um 
I think trial coming up and, you know, Wendy likes to enhance her profile before a trial. And what happened was that she called us in February and uh, mentioned that her, her 13 year old, now we're going back to some Jewish practices, is getting a bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah yeah. And what happened was I said, you know, we haven't seen the kids for six years. We were delighted. Uh, can we take them for ice cream the day before? The kids don't even know who we are. And they were little babies. Anyway, so then she wrote me back. You know what? She said, if you want an in-person visit, why don't you come in April? And and that's what we did. So Phil and I, this is the beginning. We just saw that 2022 is the breakthrough. We saw the children on April 20th. We had an excellent visit. We yeah. come back to Toronto. April 21st in the morning, I get a call from the FBI. Charlie Adelson's arrested. So this is a 24-hour period. Wow. Like, two breakthroughs in this life of you know whatever and uh we didn't we saw the children it was a very nice visit unfortunately after charlie's arrest in fact two days after wendy disinvited us to the bar mitzvah oh, uh, it, was a <laughs> it was a whole issue of safety but we there was zoom they we could have been on zoom but that's another story we're working on keeping some continuity so that the boys don't get abandoned by Dan's family. Just so there you have it. There is a, a snippet from um, uh, the interview with Ruth Markell. Obviously she, she talks about that. Obviously this was, she's referring to <clears throat> back to uh, um, Charlie Adelson's arrest when she gets the news on the day that she actually gets to see her grandchildren. So, um, but way to really turn her pain into purpose, way for her to help change the the law and and the situations for um, for other people who are in similar circumstances. Uh, as someone who strived his entire life to be able to create that through not only my film but my content to allow people to know that you know, people who are in similar circumstances to be sort of a beacon of life, light. Uh, some people have referred to me as a lighthouse, which I think is interesting. <laughs> um, and I'll take it for sure. But um, to see someone else reciprocate that for the good of other people is really, is really quite extraordinary. And so obviously the light of her son lives on through her and, um, and hopefully her grandchildren will see that. Now, something that I can speak very intimately on um, is the children. So um, uh, Lincoln and Benjamin, uh, and I don't know what their ages are. I believe I believe Benjamin, who is the older one, I believe is probably around fourteen now. As someone who was twelve when his father was convicted for the murder of his mother, um, I'm grateful that they have family that is in their life. Um, but I would, I would be remiss if I didn't say that, that, that the struggle that these children are going to end up going through throughout their life is going to be very real and very challenging. Um, I think one of the, the most difficult things to process in a situation like this, and, and I can speak with absolute authority on this is the betrayal that you feel, um, Obviously, my circumstance is a little bit different because I witnessed my father take the life of my mother. So uh, I heard it happen and obviously worked to secure his arrest and, and conviction and um, and continued incarceration. But uh, so I was very active in that. And that is something for as difficult and as challenging as it was in those moments as a young child. Um, uh, as an adult, I'm very grateful for because, and, and I've done a Ted talk on this, but I feel like one of the things that leads you through a lot of trauma is by being in action, by being of, of action, by feeling of service, by being of service, by moving forward, by moving past, past the trauma, by moving on and doing something positive with your life or feeling proactive in this, um, it is a blessing as hard as it is. And as maybe as, as odd as that may sound to some of you in the audience, it is definitely something that I'm very grateful for. These boys haven't been afforded this opportunity. And 
as they get older and process this, now they're going to process the, the betrayal of their uncle. Right. And this is, you know, I can remember the headline at my father's, um, uh, at my father's trial, it was in the newspaper and it said murder most foul. And this is another one of those cases that is a murder most foul. This is something that is a premeditated situation that is, was completely unnecessary. A, a dramatic escalation of something that apparently stemmed from just a grudge to begrudging to taking the life of an innocent man, a father. I don't care how, how much you dislike your, your brother-in-law. Like this is not something that any reasonable or accountable or person of any level of character does. And he will spend the rest of his life beyond, behind bars, or at least the majority of it. Charlie Adelson, ironically, is 47 years old, which is the same age my father was when he was convicted. So he has a life to look forward to if he can survive in prison, because there's a whole other thing, and I believe Surviving the Survivor is going to talk about this, but you know, this gentleman is, um, you know, he's going to spend his life in a South Florida or a Florida penitentiary full of the same gang members that he threw under the bus. For those of you that haven't spent any time in prison, and I hope that's none of you, um, but as someone who has spent a lot of time in prison, talking to people, interviewing people, and um, and just getting to know inmates, gangs are very prevalent, and they have a very they are very um, astute in the ways of getting at people that they don't like and getting revenge. Um, not that I wish anything upon anyone, but um, I would almost be guaranteed that Charlie Adelson would be put in some sort of protective custody, some sort of isolation, because um, I'm sure without a doubt, he is a marked man in prison. And obviously as a man of means, he will be marked even more so because um, that's just the way it works. It is not a good thing. It is not a good thing for anyone involved. And, and this is something that I, I again, I struggle with my entire life to sort of comprehend there's no reason for anyone to commit a crime like this or to do anything of this nature to another human being. Because at the end of the day, you will get caught. That proves this. It took almost 10 years for this family to get justice. And finally, they have it. And um, unfortunately, it looks like more dominoes are going to fall in this situation. And um, it's a lot. It's... um. <sighs> it's not something you wish on anyone. That's for sure. Um, leading your life with kindness, killing them with kindness is a much better way to live. And living well is always the best revenge. But um, I think all of you and mover nation, you guys know that if you're new to the channel, thank you for tuning in. If you check out my video here, you can check out more stories just like this. And if you're interested in more about my story, check out this video right over here. Mover Nation, thank you all so much for tuning in. If you could do me a favor, please click like and subscribe and hit the alert bell to find to get more of my exclusive content. If you are interested in joining, please consider becoming a Patreon member or a YouTube channel member by following the links below in the description box. Uh, you can join this channel. Uh, I really appreciate it. Your support, super stickers, your support of, of the Patreon, of the YouTube channel memberships helps make more content like this possible. On that note, I'm Collier Landry and this is the Collier Landry Show. I'll see y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. For exclusive content around this podcast, please consider supporting me via Patreon by going to collierlandry.com forward slash support. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. And please leave us a five-star review. If you want to see video episodes of this podcast, please check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. You can find links to additional resources in the show notes of today's episode. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio. Copyright Collier Landry.